Submarines changed warfare as we know it. When one thinks of vehicles or devices that change the scope of how humans fight and can bring conflict to an entire new level or even realm of existence, there are many different examples. The gun, the tank, the plane, and of course, the submarine. But the image that we have in our mind of submarines is a far cry from their first incarnations. So today, my friends, I wanted to go and explore that. Today, we're gonna go over the history of submarines from the little wooden spheres of old to the high stealth alloyed steel of today's cylindrical behemoths. And from that, how it is that they changed war as we know it. Hello everyone, my name is Takuyi and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining me here today. If I seem a little hyper right now, that is because it is 1 a.m. and I've had a boatload of coffee, a U-boat of coffee, if you will. Ah, okay, that was, that was probably pretty bad right there. But hey, speaking of terrible segues, before we dive right into the video, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, Ground News. One of the most troublesome things that occurs here on the History of Everything is that with me having to cover quite literally everything, I have to be very careful about my news coverage. And that, my friends, is precisely why I use a service like Ground News, something that allows me to get more balanced coverage from different sources from all around the world about different topics. Like as an example, one of my favorite things that I love to cover on this channel is geopolitics, and really, nothing in this world gets as incredibly messy as geopolitics. Considering how many things I have been covering in Africa as of late, Ground News is an incredibly valuable source because I can go and find an article on, say, Burkina Faso's junta, and I am able to organize the information I can obtain by accessing the left-wing, right-wing, or center sources from all the varying different aspects that are revealed on here. I can see the approximate factuality of the sources that I'm obtaining information from, and I can also see what the ownership of those sources are to know whether or not they are a private corporation or perhaps state-owned media. Really, Ground News is an incredibly valuable resource for me, and one of the things that I love about it is Blindspot, which allows me to be able to see what kind of news stories are being covered only by certain sources, to be able to show what biases exist within certain stories. I promise you, for anyone who has been watching my channel and wants to stay informed, Ground News is easily one of the greatest things that you can possibly get in your life. So my friends, please go to ground.news slash history of everything and start getting access to all sides of every story. And if you check it out and subscribe through my link down in the description, then you can get 30% off said subscription. Thank you, Ground News, for sponsoring this video. And now back to the show. The concept of underwater combat is actually far more ancient than we give it credit for, but it really is quite different from how it is that we think of things today. There are images of men using hollow sticks to breathe underwater for hunting at the Temple of Thebes, but the first known military use occurred during the Siege of Syracuse from 415 to 413 BC, where divers would go and clear obstructions according to the history of the Peloponnesian War. Hell is another example during the Siege of Tyre back in 332 BC, apparently Alexander the Great also used divers, at least according to Aristotle. Which actually, I have to bring this up right now. The image that you can see behind me right here, um, this is a Mughal rendition of that happening, which it's the first time I think I've ever seen Alexander the Great in a turban, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of a weird one. According to legend, what supposedly happened is that Alexander the Great descended into the sea using a kind of primitive submersible, something that's more equivalent to a diving bell of old rather than an actual submarine which is not exactly something that you can use to fight people, but I digress. For those of you confused what I'm talking about, a diving bell is something that is a rigid chamber that is used to transport divers from the surface to down below and then back, usually being something that has air that is supplied to it, or I guess in some cases, ones that did not, but you, you just had to use whatever air was left in there at the time. Typically something that was done in order to perform various types of underwater work, whether repairs or to clear obstructions from potential hazards down below after shipwrecks. Which can Considering the topic that we're talking about today is not exactly a combat vehicle, but I do find the idea of divers going down in bells and fighting each other by trying to tip over each other's bells freaking hilarious, man. That sounds great. Either way, that all being said, like many other inventions such as the tank, the history of the submarine is something that goes back all the way to the 1500s when Leonardo da Vinci would first try to conceptualize a boat, something that wasn't just something that could sail above water, but one that was capable of sailing underwater and sinking other ships. Now, da Vinci never went ahead and made that submarine design, much in the same way as many of his other ideas, but what's interesting to note is that when he did this, he specifically cited that he was not going to develop this because of the, quote, evil nature of men, as they would use it to sink enemy ships, 
causing the death of their occupants. And I mean, honestly, among all things, technically speaking, he, he was right that that is precisely what submarines would end up being used for. So he's not wrong, right? Like, that, that that's true. And although, like with the case of Leonardo, there were a number of various plans for submersibles or submarines during the Middle Ages, no one was ever really able to do anything. It wasn't until the Englishman William Bourne would go and design a prototype submarine in the year 1578 that we would finally start to get at least a little somewhere. The diagram of which you can actually see behind me here. The basic premise of it is that this was supposed to be a completely enclosed boat that would then be submersed and rowed beneath the surface. Of course, talking materials at the time, people weren't utilizing metal as you would see in the later centuries. Instead, this was going to be a completely wooden vessel that was going to be sheathed in waterproofed leather. What you can then see is it was supposed to be submerged by using a hand-operated wooden screw thread and adjustable plungers that were pressing against flexible leather bags that were located at the sides. And these apparently would have increased and decreased the amount of water to reflect buoyancy for the vessel itself. Now, from the image that you can see behind me here, there really is no accommodations for crew or anything like that, which is rather interesting to note. But what it appears that this thing is, is nothing more than a prototype that never moved beyond the theoretical stages. Like, again, the literal drawing stage. And so it is, despite the fact that this thing is rather interesting, simultaneously, we can't exactly say that Bourne was the one to invent the submarine. No, for that, we're actually going to have to look at a Dutchman. A Dutchman who was in the service of King James I of England, who made a submarine back in the year 1620, or at least the first stages of what we would call a submarine. Drebbel's submarine is something that is truly fascinating, as this is a vessel that was propelled by oars underwater, or at least it seems to be. The precise nature of the submarine really is unclear, as it may have been possible that instead of a boat, it was in and of itself a bell that was towed by a boat. There really isn't any way to confirm. But what appears to have happened is that between 1620 and 1624, Drebbel would successfully build and test two more submarines, with each one being bigger than the previous one. The final model that he ended up constructing had six oars and was capable of carrying 16 passengers. This model was demonstrated to King James I in person, as well as several thousand Londoners. The submarine would stay submerged for three hours and could travel from Westminster to Greenwich and back, cruising at a depth between four to five meters. The really interesting thing to note is that James I, the King of England, actually went in one of these trips, meaning that James I was the first ever monarch to travel underwater, so to speak, if you don't really count any of the other stuff with diving bells or anything that potentially could have been used by Alexander the Great, which is absolutely fascinating. And one of the firsthand accounts that would describe this entire event would list it as such. Worth all the rest put together is the little ship, in which he calmly dived under the water, while he kept the king and several thousand Londoners in great suspense. The great majority of these already thought that the man who had very cleverly remained invisible to them for three hours, as rumor has it, had perished, when he suddenly rose to the surface a considerable distance from where he had dived down, bringing with him the several companions of his dangerous adventure to witness to the fact that they had experienced no trouble or fear under the water, but had sat on the bottom. When they so desired, and had ascended when they wished to do so, that they had sailed whithersoever they had a mind, rising as much near the surface, or again, diving as much deeper as it pleased them to do, without even being deprived of light, yea, even that they had done in the belly of that whale all the things which people used to do in the air, and this without any trouble. From all this, it is not hard to imagine that it would have to be the usefulness of the bold invention in times of war, if, in this manner, a thing which I have repeatedly heard Drebel assert, enemy ships lie lying safely at anchor, could be secretly attacked and sunk, unexpectedly utilizing a battering ram, an instrument of which hideous use is made nowadays in the capturing of the gates and bridges of towns. Which, from the description that they're giving there, makes it sound as though this was something that was prepared for war. So, I guess the question is, was it? No, no, absolutely not. No, 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 no. This, this thing was not ready at all. The submarine that we're talking about here was tested extensively in the Thames many times, but the thing is, it just couldn't really attract the enthusiasm of the Admiralty, and it was never used in combat. Hell, they didn't even make an attempt to try to use it in combat. In fact, one of the more recent things that has been suggested by historians is that this first submarine's capabilities were heavily exaggerated, specifically in order to pump up the value and prestige of James I and, well, the inventors of the time. As it seems that the entire thing was at most semi submerged and not entirely submersible, something that was only capable of traveling down the Thames by force of the current and not able to do anything itself. This was not something that could be utilized for war. 
At least, not yet. And Dreville wasn't the only one to try to build such a thing. Later on that century, there was a Frenchman by the name of Dennis Payne who would go and design and build two different submarines. The first one being a square shape, which was accidentally destroyed, and the second one being an oval shape. Both of these were made from metal, and it wasn't very long after that numerous inventors would start to patent their own designs, as it was clear that submarines, well, now this was going to be a very interesting thing that potentially had some grand military applications. If only they could figure out how to do it. And that's, um, that, that was something that was going to take multiple tries. As an example of one of the events that I'm talking about here, the image that you can see behind me here is from the First Anglo-Dutch War of 1652 to 1654, and that would see a rather interesting weapon try to be used during that time. There was an inventor by the name of Louis de Son who decided that he was going to build a 22 meter long boat called the Rotterdam boat in order to help in the war effort. The image that you can see behind me here is what it is that I'm talking about, and this was effectively a semi-submerged battering ram. And no, I'm not kidding. It was something that would hide partly below the waterline and then try to sneak up on British ships and ram them in order to sink them. Which I have to say, from the very beginning, sounds like an absolutely stellar idea. Truly wonderful. Except, um, there was there, there was one very big key problem with, with this invention. You couldn't actually control it? Like, no, I kid you not. The basic problem with this vessel is that once you actually launched it, there was no way to further propel it. So you pretty much had to launch the battering ram in the direction of a ship and just hope that it hit something. So naturally speaking, it didn't really work. Still though, this was an idea that was fairly popular and by the mid 18th century, over a dozen different patents for submarines or submersible boats had been granted in England alone, but other places were going to try their hand at it as well. As an example of one of these, which might surprise a number of you, in the East, there was an inventor by the name of Yefim Nikonov, who would go and build the first military submarine back in the year 1720 on the orders of Peter the Great of Russia, or at least he tried to. I mean, seriously, you can see the image of the thing behind me right here, where it looks like quite literally a giant barrel that has been malformed into a relative boat shape. And the entire purpose of this, the way that it was designed, is that the ship was supposed to approach an enemy ship undetected, and then launch a combustible mixture at the target via tubes that would run along the water surface. It's crazy when we look at this thing because Nikonov had even included an airlock into the submarine design, which is something that no one had really used at that point. So, okay, we have the first military submarine, right? Right? No, the whole thing never came to fruition. Why, you may wonder? Well, the entire project was canceled because Peter the Great would go and die in 1725, which, um, which, which meant that all the funding for this project completely dried up. So no, the first military sub wasn't going to happen quite just yet. Fast forward a little bit of time, and in 1747, you would have Nathaniel Simmons, who who would patent and build the first known working example of the use of a ballast tank for submersion, a crucial part of any kind of sub. His design would use leather bags that could fill with water to submerge the craft, and then had a mechanism that would be used to twist the water out of the bags, thus causing the boat to resurface again. All things that were important, but still no war usage. Until you get this tiny little event that I'm sure that none of you, absolutely none of you have ever heard of before, the, um, the American Revolution. You see, my friends, one of the more interesting things about the American Revolution is that back during it, there was an American inventor by the name of David Bushnell who had the idea of creating a submersible vessel that was capable of tacking British shipping and freeing America from the blockade that was choking it off from world supplies. Bushnell may have begun studying underwater explosions while he had attended Yale College, and by early 1775, he had created a reliable method for detonating underwater explosives, a clockwork connected to a musket firing mechanism, probably something that was a flintlock that was adapted for the purpose of underwater warfare, which I just love the idea of immediately off the top of my head, a flintlock bomb underwater, just simply beautiful. So the way that all of this went down is that after the battles of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, Bushnell began to work near Old Saybrook on a small, individually manned submersible that was designed to attach an explosive charge to the hull of an enemy ship, which, as he would write to Benjamin Franklin, would be, quote, constructed with great simplicity and upon principles of natural philosophy, end quote. And what he made essentially looked like a giant acorn. No, I'm not kidding. You, 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 can, you can see it right there. The overall design here is an absolutely fascinating one as it's not something that normally when we think about submarines is something that we probably would consider a submarine. But it really was an incredibly interesting device. This one man wooden craft would rely on a human powered hand crank as well as a foot treadle for propulsion and a pedal operated water tank would allow it to submerge and surface, as well as having a lead ballast that would keep it upright in the water. If it was operated properly, and this is the key word, 
properly, mind you, then theoretically what this thing was going to be capable of doing was approaching an enemy ship underwater and using a screw to plant a mine with a 150 pound charge of gunpowder. Seems simple, right? Do you not have absolute faith in that face? Well, the problem was is that many different setbacks were going to end up plaguing the design process. The mine in particular, the very thing that you needed to destroy enemy ships, was delayed several times from its expected completion from 1771 to 1776, a difference of five years. Piloting the turtle, moreover, would require great physical stamina as well as coordination. And here's what it is that I mean. Not only did you need to have the energy to be able to do all of these things in order to operate the ship in the first place, but the operator would have to adjust the bilge in order to keep it from sinking, while simultaneously providing his own propulsion by use of a crank, which would work a propeller that was located on the front of the submarine, and direction by use of a lever that would operate and direct a rudder in the back. As for how much air this thing would contain in the first place, it was only around 30 minutes, meaning its actual operation time was exceptionally limited, especially considering the fact that this thing didn't have an engine that was going to drive you forward. It was all operated by a freaking hand crank. So obviously extensive training was going to be needed in order to have any degree of hope for operating this thing correctly. And that's precisely what happened, right? No, 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 it's... That, that didn't exactly happen. In the early morning hours of September 7th, 1776, a Continental Army soldier by the name of Ezra Lee would launch history's first ever submarine attack when he would pilot the turtle, as it was called, underneath the British warship, the HMS Eagle in New York Harbor. Lee had only received minimal training, however, and after failing to attach a time bomb to the ship's hull, he would abort the mission and detonate his mine in the open water. But it's okay, they can just try again, right? Well, they did, and it still didn't work. After the failure of this attack, they would try multiple other times to do the same thing, and all of those attempts would also end in failure, which would later cause Bushnell to abandon the submarine project. But at the very least, his invention is something that did earn him the respect of many of the other patriots that were fighting for the American Revolution. As George Washington, the man who would become the first president of the United States, would later say, quote, I then thought, still think, that it was an effort of genius. Which, yes, yes it was, but it did not work. So, okay, now we finally have the first ever submarine attack in history, and it is a failure. Not exactly something that is going to revolutionize warfare, but at the very least, it's not the worst start, even if it's not a great one. But the important thing is that people now really had a demonstration of what could be possible. There was very obviously potential in this, even if it didn't work initially with the technology and the skill and technique that they had at the time. Now, if only they could get it right. And that, my friends, is going to bring us to another American inventor, one by the name of Robert Fulton, who while working for the French government in 1800, would go on to design his own submarine, the Nautilus. And this was a rather interesting craft, as some people have labeled it to be the first modern submarine. Though, uh, among all things, this... It, Definitely doesn't exactly look modern. Still, even if it looks rather odd, the 21-foot ship would feature several revolutionary innovations, including a cigar-shaped hull as well as a copper conning tower. It used a hand-powered, four-bladed propeller to move underwater, but it also simultaneously would sport a collapsible mast as well as a fan sail to be able to travel on the surface. Diving planes were used to assist in submerging, and Fulton would also experiment with storing compressed air in copper bottles to be able to provide oxygen for his crew. And as for whether or not it would work, well, it kind of did. After a few test drives, they discovered that it was capable of reaching a depth of just over 7.5 meters. And if you were trying to propel the thing forward, then with its propulsion system, it was capable of reaching a speed of around four knots, which, although that's not fast at all, it was still something that, considering the technology, was decent, at least. And as for how it would actually attack things, well, the idea of it was that this craft would tow a bomb behind it, something that was termed to be a torpedo at the time. And for all intents and purposes, the basic idea of it was fairly solid. Now it's just a matter of putting it to use, which um is where things kind of start to go wrong. Even if the idea of the Nautilus is a rather interesting one, it doesn't really matter if it doesn't work in the first place, and that is uh, precisely what would happen. Unfortunately for him, the Royal Navy would very easily notice when the Nautilus was approaching, and so it was never able to successfully take out an enemy ship. The failure of this repeatedly over and over again would end up leading to Fulton's dismissal from France. And as for what happened to the Nautilus sub itself, well, because the whole thing wasn't going to be useful in the first place, it ended up being dismantled and sold for scrap. And although that would end in failure, at least on a more positive note for Fulton, what would end up happening to him is that he would go back to America and actually win fame again for developing the world's first commercially viable steamboat. So at least if things didn't end all that horribly for him. So, okay, yet again, we have another failure when it comes to submarines. Not exactly the best way that we could have started out this video and how submarines changed warfare, but you know, you still have to start somewhere. 
And these failures weren't necessarily going to last because eventually there was going to be a successful use of a submarine, a successful attack. Once again, by an American, ironically enough. Except this time, it was going to be an American vessel that was fighting other American vessels. This would be the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, used back in the year 1863. For context of what we are talking about here, this is the American Civil War. And the Union forces of the North had managed to retain control of the Navy. And its blockade of the South meant that the Confederacy was bound to search for ways to try and break it in order to be able to supply themselves. And the submarine was one of these. Now, that all being said, several different prototypes of varying submarines were built by both sides, but these were designs that weren't necessarily anything new or crazy. They were things that primarily depended upon improving old techniques versus developing anything new themselves. And so built privately in Mobile, Alabama back in 1863, the H.L. Hunley was something that was fashioned from a recycled iron steam boiler and included space for eight crewmen. You had one to steer and seven to turn the hand cranks that would power its propeller. Its bow would bristle with a 17 17- foot long spar mounted with a torpedo which would detonate when it was rammed against an enemy ship which i have to say from the very beginning sounds dangerous and um yeah yeah you would 100 be right because early tests would earn the hunley the nickname of being a coffin and for very good reason because during two of its trial runs it sank killing the crew members that were inside like 13 people died over the course of making this thing and one of those crew members was the engineer who made the thing in the first place, Horace Lawson Hunley. Like the inventor of it died and they still continued to use this thing because damn it, they were gonna make this thing work. And I mean, I guess they still kind of did. The sub would be repeatedly salvaged no matter how many times it failed and eventually it was going to end up being used in combat. A lieutenant by the name of George Dixon and a crew of volunteers would sail it into Charleston Harbor and would successfully drive its torpedo into the side of a sloop of war called the USS Housatonic. The Union vessel would end up going down in minutes, but... At the same time, the Hunley would also sink with it, possibly because of damage that was sustained during its attack. And so the truly ironic thing about the submarine is that despite the fact that it was the first ever successful attack of a submarine in history, it um, simultaneously ended up destroying itself in the process. So um, yeah, yeah, all the Confederates aboard perished. And mind you, they would not be the only ones to fail in their use of a submarine during this time. As an example of this, in South America, you had the Chilean government that would use a submarine in its war of independence against Spain, but this vessel would end up sinking with all 11 crew members aboard, and yeah, that whole thing did not work out. In 1879, the Peruvians would also build an 11-man submarine during its war against Chile, but this submarine ended up being scuttled to avoid it being captured. Just all around, not necessarily anything very successful. All the while, over time, more and more improvements to designs were desired. People really wanted to make this thing work. But really, submarines could not be put into widespread use until they were actually capable of moving on their own, not by a system of a hand crank or anything, but actually self-propulsion. Which actually brings us to this vehicle that you can see behind me here, which is a French vessel called the Diver that was one of the first submarines to ever use mechanical power to, well, power it. This was a French-made craft that was designed by naval officers Simone Bourgeois and Charles Brun. And rather than relying on hand cranks or foot pedals or treadmills or anything else for that matter that required hand power to move its propeller, this 140-foot monster of a vehicle would instead use a piston engine that was powered by compressed air stored in tanks. Simultaneously, the interesting little detail is that because it was using compressed air, that air would also help provide the crew with oxygen and would serve as a means of automatically emptying its ballast tanks. It was an interesting little vessel, though when I say little, I mean it definitely wasn't little for the time, all things considered, and it would manage to make several successful dives. But with its very limited air supply, as well as dangerous structure, like this thing was not necessarily well designed at all, it ended up being removed from active duty in 1872, so it didn't really stick around very long. But this would lead us to the real breakthrough that we needed, the birth of the modern submarine, specifically courtesy of John Philip Holland. This was an individual that towards the end of the 19th century would become the first designer to successfully unite three new pieces of technology. We're talking about the electric motor, the electric battery, and the internal combustion engine. All things that were going to be vital to create a submarine, and he is the individual that would create the first recognizably modern submarine. And I have to say, his whole story is a rather interesting one. Because while he was a teacher in Cork, John Philip Holland would read an account of the battle between the ironclads, the Monitor, and Virginia during the American Civil War. 
And he quickly realized that with the way that things were developing technologically, that the best way to attack and defeat these kinds of ships was going to be below the waterline rather than firing at them from above. He noted that the reason for the Monitor's victory was specifically because of its low freeboard. She was very difficult to hit. And so he wondered, well, okay, well, why don't we just go completely underwater and make the entire vessel submerged? Seemed easy enough. So what he goes and immediately does is designs his own craft to try and develop and get some investors for it, but unfortunately, no one is really interested at that time. So instead, he goes to the United States. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as he goes over to the United States, he slips and falls on an icy Boston street and he breaks his leg and is just stuck there for a while, forced to recuperate. And while he's recuperating in his bed with a broken leg, he has all this time in the world to begin to design things. And that's precisely what it is that he does. In 1875, Holland would go and submit his more refined schematics to the U.S. Navy for consideration. But unfortunately, these two were also rejected as the Navy felt that they just simply weren't practical. They couldn't really develop anything with them. So even more time would go by. And over time, John Philip Holland would continue to improve his designs and work on several experimental vessels prior to his success efforts with a privately built type that ended up being launched on the 17th of May, 1897. And this, my friends, happened to be the first submarine to use a combination of electric motors as well as a gasoline engine for underwater as well as surface propulsion. Now, we are truly getting somewhere. The vessel ended up being purchased by the U.S. Navy in April of 1900, and after extensive testing, the vessel was commissioned as the USS Holland. Six more of these ended up being ordered by the Navy to be built at the Crescent Shipyard in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and from there, Holland would see some pretty good success. These orders would allow Holland to create his own company, the Electric Boat Company, that would end up being founded in 1899. A number of you may not exactly recognize that name because it's rather unassuming, but it is important to note that this is a company that would eventually evolve to become General Dynamics, one of the major defense contractors of the United States. And it started as an electric boat company. And America is not where he would see his only success. Holland's design would end up being adopted by others, including the Royal Navy, who would develop their own Holland class submarine. At the same time, the Imperial Japanese Navy would also employ his designs, as well as make some minor refinements for their first five submarines. The Japanese versions, as a point of note, were at least three meters longer than the Holland, at around 19.5 meters length total. Which is very awesome for him, but I should go ahead and specify at this time that despite this seeming success and acceptance, simultaneously, there's a little bit of an issue. The official position of the Admiralty of Britain was that submarine development was not to be given any kind of encouragement but it couldn't necessarily afford to ignore it completely. So as a result of that, in October of 1900, they would order five Hollands for the purpose of testing for, quote, the value of the submarine in the hands of our enemy, end quote. The Hollands would be built under license at the Vickers Yard and Barrow, which would eventually become the home of the British submarine construction. You see, my friends, the traditionalist view at the Admiralty thought of submarine warfare was, in the words of Rear Admiral Wilson, underhanded, unfair, and damned un-English. The majority of people within the Admiralty simply thought that it was something that was cowardly at best and unnecessary more often than not. But not all of the Admiralty was so dismissive. There was an individual by the name of Admiral Jackie Fisher who, instead of being an opponent of the submarine, actually became one of its biggest proponents. Having watched five Hollands go and sink four warships in an exercise to defend Portsmouth Harbor, Fisher realized that naval warfare was something that had completely changed. So when he became First Sea Lord from 1904 to 1910, he went and diverted 5% of the Navy's shipbuilding budget, despite very strong opposition, to specifically the construction of submarines. And so from the beginning of Fisher's tenure to the outbreak of World War I, there was continuous development of the submarine. And so from the beginning of Fisher's tenure to the outbreak of the First World War, there was continual development of the submarine from Hollands through A to D classes. With the D class, with its decking and deck gun, representing a major change from the porpoise shape of earlier submarines, and introduced the form that would become familiar through two world wars. It's also important to note that by this time that torpedoes were no longer the bomb on the end of a stick that were going to be rammed into an opponent's ship. No, instead, these things were self-propelled bombs that were capable of being fired from a vessel. The first of these were made by an English inventor named Robert Whitehead, who would develop the first experimental model of a torpedo that could move on its own in 1866. This being a device that was propelled by a two-cylinder compressed air engine, and this early version could travel 200 yards at a speed of around 6.5 knots. 
By 1868, Whitehead would go and refine his design and begin selling two sizes of his Mark I torpedoes to navies all around the world. You had an 11-foot, 8-inch model with a 40-pound explosive and a larger 14-foot model with a 60-pound explosive. And both of these would perform relatively similarly, running at 8 to 10 knots with a range of 200 yards, the only difference being the payload that it was capable of delivering. And so now, now we were finally getting somewhere. And unfortunately, that somewhere is World War I. The true start of the submarine in its most classical sense. I know that it's rather ironic, but the nation that would end up becoming synonymous with submarine warfare put very little effort, comparatively speaking, into building their submarine arm in the years before the First World War. The German fleet was constructed by Alfred Peter Friedrich von Tirpitz, and this was intended as a showpiece depicting German power as a blue water battle fleet. Submarines were something that, although they were an interesting device, that wasn't a true element of German power. And Germany needed to compete with Great Britain in its finest form. To beat the British at their own navy was perhaps the greatest achievement that they could ever have. That being said, the Germans did develop submarines in the years before the war, but by the time that things broke out in 1914, they only possessed around 28 of them. Still though, that didn't mean that the Germans dismissed submarines. In fact, it couldn't be more than the opposite. The German Admiralty staff specifically saw these weapons as a key component in what they called Kleinkrieg, which was a form of naval guerrilla warfare in which light craft, such as submarines and torpedo boats, could be used to continuously attack the stronger British fleet once it would institute a close blockade of German ports. The idea of it is that as the British came closer to the German shore, they would be able to utilize these lighter craft, which were significantly cheaper in order to be able to take out more expensive targets, which seemed like a relatively smart idea at the time. The only problem was the British weren't exactly going to comply with the German strategy, because what would happen in the actual course of events is that the British did not implement a close blockade. Instead, what they did was opt for a more distant blockade at the exits to the North Sea. And with their initial purpose having been foiled, the German submarines now had to be sent on patrols into the North Sea in order to directly attack British warships. And on occasion, they would enjoy some success, with the most significant example of it being on September 1914, when Lieutenant Otto Edward Wedigan would be able to ambush and sink three obsolete British cruisers. Additional successes would come in tight waters around the Dardanelles Strait in early 1915, but for the most part, submarines just at this time were too fragile on the surface and too slow when submerged to really be used against modern warships. You see, my friends, the Germans over the course of the war primarily used three different types of U-boats. You had the U-boat, which was the standard larger one, and then in addition to that, you had two smaller ones called the UB and the UC. Now, all of these craft would develop over the course of the war as needs would change based on the conflict and how it is that it would shift. By the time that the second unrestricted campaign would begin in the year 1917, a representative fleet boat had the following specifications. They would typically displace 837 tons, could reach speeds of 17 knots on the surface, and eight when submerged, and would mount a 10.5 centimeter deck gun, as well as carry between 12 and 16 torpedoes. The UB class, on the other hand, was a much smaller submarine that was designed for work in the narrow waters around the British coast. This was significantly smaller, to the point that it would displace only around 500 tons, but could reach 13 knots on the surface and nearly 8 submerged, as well as mounting an 8.8 centimeter gun and carrying 10 torpedoes. These were then accompanied by the smallest class of submarine, the mine layers, the UC class, which would displace only around 400 tons. These could travel at 11 knots on the surface and nearly 7 submerged, while mounting an 8.8 centimeter gun, and could carry 7 torpedoes along with 18 mines. In addition to the submarines that we're talking about there, the Germans also tried their hands at experimenting with merchant submarines, effectively submarines that were going to be able to sneak past the British blockade and get goods in and out of Germany. But um, those, those things didn't really work at all, and only six ended up being built. So if the Germans were not going to be able to utilize their submarine in order to take out enemy warships, then the idea was perhaps hunt enemy merchant vessels instead. Now, this is something that is going to require a little bit of an explanation, but the use of warships against commerce is something that has been done all over the course of history. But specifically in World War I, this was governed by a series of rules that were designed to safeguard the lives of merchant seamen. Theoretically speaking, warships were supposed to stop, search, and capture or sink enemy merchant ships, but 
only after ascertaining that the ship was carrying contraband, which is a rather flexible term, but for many cases would mean goods that could be used for military purposes. But simultaneously, even if they were sinking the enemy ship, they were supposed to make proper provision for the survival of the crew of the merchantmen. The British, of course, during this time period would take countermeasures to try and protect their merchant shipping. After all, we are talking about the British Empire that has its forces and nation spread out across the entire globe. And one such measure that they would develop over this time is by just installing guns onto the merchant vessel, like turn it into its own kind of rudimentary crude warship which could work. Like, here's the thing. Early war German submarines were so lightly armed that even a lightly equipped merchant vessel was capable of outgunning one. And so as this became apparent, naturally speaking, German vessels were not going to go after vessels that were so clearly armed. And this is where the British Q ship would come into play. See, the Q ship was a rather interesting device that the British would develop, which was when they would have a merchantman that would be equipped with concealed guns, things that would only attack an enemy submarine that approached them and take them completely by surprise. Taken together, these measures would make the rules of commerce warfare extremely hazardous for German submariners, and it was a very dangerous business indeed that could get many of them killed. The British would also further muddy the waters for German submarine commanders by flying the flags of neutral countries instead of their own flag, thus passing themselves off as neutrals to try and not become a target. And so in response to these measures, as well as using the British blockade as justification, the German government would give its submarines to attack enemy shipping without actually adhering to the prize rules or the rules that they had established when dealing with commerce before. In particular, the big thing was um, attacking ships without warning. This is something that came to be known as unrestricted submarine warfare, and a campaign would officially be launched on the 4th of February 1915. The waters around Britain were declared to be a war zone, and the German government would go on to declare that any and all enemy shipping in the area would be sunk without warning. It was also noted at this time that it wasn't necessarily possible to be able to distinguish between what was neutral shipping and what was enemy shipping, so those were likely to be sunk as well. Of course, naturally speaking, when we're talking about this, the foreign reaction to the German campaign was overwhelmingly negative. No one was happy about this whatsoever. And the British, of course, would very quickly condemn the entire thing as an illegal act of piracy. More important were the reactions of the major neutral nations who would also heavily object to the legality of the new campaign. After all, even with them being neutral, there was a decent chance that they were going to end up being affected, and the most significant neutral among all of these was the United States. The sinking of the British passenger ship, the Lusitania, would end up happening on the 7th of May, 1915, just four months into the campaign. And American pressure from this event would actually end up leading to the changing in German strategy for its submarines at the time, or at least for a short time. They tried to exclude passenger liners as well as hospital ships from attacks, but the problem was is that the incidents would continue. And because these incidents would continue, the Germans would eventually move their submarines out of the Atlantic and more towards the Mediterranean, where there was very little American shipping. But the problem was, this didn't really affect the Allies nearly to the same degree as what the Germans were hoping could happen, while still maintaining some degree of neutrality with the United States. So, it, it, it didn't really work. And so when the German Admiral Reinhard Scheer would end up taking over as commander of the High Sea Fleet in 1916, he went and reversed this decision, ordering the submarines to go back into the North Sea, where they would once again support the High Sea Fleet. Even if they thought that they could change something, the submarines were no more effective attacking modern warships under Scheer than they had been earlier under previous commanders. It just wasn't something that made all that big a difference. And as the war dragged on to the winter of 1916 through 1917, things would only get worse as the war seemed to have no end in sight. In Germany, the potato crop would fail, and this would bring on what was known as and this would bring on what was known as the Turnip Winter, a time that was certainly a great suffering for the people of Germany. Thus, as this occurred, the increasingly desperate German government would eventually turn back to the idea of unrestricted submarine warfare. By the time of February of 1917, the Germans had managed to acquire over 100 submarines, which was a very big difference in comparison to the 20-something that they had started out with at the beginning of the war. And this is where they got a desperate last-ditch idea, or at least this was the idea of Admiral Henning von Holzendorf. See, it was his idea that if the Germans were capable of sinking 600,000 tons of Allied shipping every single month for the next six months, then this means that Britain would be quite literally starved of supplies and that it would be forced to surrender because it would not have the means by which it could feed its own empire. As a result of that, unrestricted submarine warfare would begin once again on the 1st of February 1917. And so now, with roughly 30 submarines at sea at any time, the Germans began to enjoy enormous success. 
success. In February, the Germans would sink 520,000 tons of shipping. The next month in March, they would sink 564,000 tons. And in April, they would manage to sink an insane 860,000 tons. Out of desperation, the British began to institute a convoy system to try and protect their merchantmen. And eventually, the convoy system would prove effective, but it is something that would take time to organize and fully implement it. And in the meantime, the submarines would continue to wreak havoc among their ships. In May, they would sink 616,000. In June, 696,000. And in July, as convoys became more and more widespread, 555,000. Technically speaking, by this point, the submarines had reached their goal. They had done precisely what Admiral Holzendorf had predicted earlier, except the other part of his prediction, the surrender of Britain, didn't happen. In fact, the only thing that really managed to happen during this time period is that the United States would end up entering the war on the Allied side, thus dooming Germany even further. Germany would remain in the war, but at this point, with the defeat of the submarine campaign, or rather its lack of effectiveness at ending the war, this effectively spelled the end of Germany. In November of 1918, a new German government would recognize their defeat and would end the war. Now, even though we're talking about the end of the war at this point, one has to understand that German submarines over the course of World War I had a massive impact. It truly is the time in which it could have potentially changed the entire scope of war itself. Over the course of the war, the the Germans managed to sink over 6,300 Allied ships, displacing a total of approximately 12 million tons of shipping. And in exchange for this loss, how much did they lose, I wonder? Well, the answer was only 229 submarines, for an average of nearly 52,000 tons sunk per submarine. But still, unfortunately for them, it was not enough. And this is where things take a rather interesting turn. Although the subsequent Treaty of Versailles would require the surrender of all U-boats at the time at the end of World War I and would prohibit the future possession of them by Germany, submarine construction would begin again by Germany after they would repudiate the peace pact in 1935. World War I had demonstrated that U-boats could be extremely powerful weapons. And so when war would return in 1939, well, so did the U-boat. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that at the time, it didn't really seem to matter for the British. I mean, lulled into the belief that ASDIC, which is an early sonar system that they had in order to detect subs, would make subs irrelevant. Like, it just wasn't something that they were going to be able to utilize properly for warfare anymore. The British government, advised by the Admiralty, agreed in 1935 to let Germany start having the same amount of tonnage of submarines as the Royal Navy. That was going to end up being a very costly mistake. Take. By the time that World War II would commence, Germany would have around 57 submarines, all under the command of Commodore Karl Donitz, who had served on U-boats back in World War I. And with Donitz, Donitz believed that the war could be decided in the Atlantic and that he could win it with approximately 300 U-boats. Optimistic, to be sure, but he did understand exactly how to use them. So in May of 1940, Germany would go and approve unrestricted submarine warfare on all shipping around Great Britain, after initially rejecting the idea in order to avoid provoking powers like the United States. Once in possession of the ports of Norway, as well as Western France, Germany would extend its range of U-boats to disrupt all merchant shipping within its reach. U-boats would stalk their targets for days and attack in groups that the British would later call wolf packs. From the summer of 1940 to the spring of 1941, each U-boat at sea would sink an average of eight merchant ships a month in what Germany would later call the happy time. Of course, at this time, they're calling it the happy time because eventually things would turn against them, but we're not quite there yet. This was the heyday of the submarine. And although almost immediately as this would start, the British would implement a convoy system similar to what they had done in World War I, it just wasn't something that really had all that much protection for the first 18 months. Radar would remain relatively primitive. Aircraft were few in number, they lacked sufficient range, and they couldn't provide escort coverage at night, and the Allies also lacked intelligence on U-boat movements. They simply didn't know where they were going to hit. The problem was, the Germans did. See, Germany had intercepted cables that were going between American shipping insurance firms as well as European underwriters to learn about ships' cargoes, their sailing dates, their destinations. All of this information was known to Germany and its wolf packs were going to hunt and feast. After the United States would then enter World War II, a wave of 16 U-boats would attack merchant shipping all up and down the American-Canadian shoreline as part of Operation Drumbeat, or 
another name as the Germans would have it at the time, the second happy time. Taking advantage of a weak and disorganized defense, U-boats would roam as far as the Gulf of Mexico and would cruise inshore shipping lanes during the first half of 1942. U-boats that lurked along North Carolina shipping lanes would sink an average of 78 merchant ships and kill 1,200 merchant marines. And for a time, as I said, this worked. The strategy would work until around mid-1943, and then things would start to change. By this time, the Germans had lost only around 250 submarines, and yet they had managed to sink 3,000 Allied vessels. But in May of that year, things would really start to turn against them. Within the month of May alone, the Germans having lost 42 submarines. This would in turn force Donitz to withdraw his fleet from the Atlantic. Even so, they would still try to fight the Allies, but what would end up happening from this time period is that over the next two years, they would only manage to sink 200 ships, and yet they would simultaneously lose 500 submarines. American aid, the convoy system, long-range air cover, and improvements in detection as well as anti-submarine weapons all had massive effects, and the Germans, by this point, simply could not keep up. And so now, having lost the Battle of the Atlantic, the Germans had to rethink their strategy and what it is that they could possibly do in order to challenge Allied shipping again. And one of those developments was the invention of a device called the snorkel, which in a similar kind of concept to what we would think of a diver using a snorkel to be able to breathe, this was the same kind of factor for a submarine, where if a submarine was equipped with a snorkel, then it was going to be capable of utilizing its diesel engine while just below the surface. This is something that would allow the submarine to conserve its battery power and simultaneously by traveling below the water, this would make it less visible from the air, which is great for them. But simultaneously, what would happen is that the snorkel would end up leaving a trailing wake. And that is something that could be picked up by sonar. So it's a little bit of a trade off, like better against air, but also makes it more visible to other ships. But the Germans had to do whatever it is that they could. The standard U-boat that they were using at the time was the Type 7, of which more than 700 of these had been built over the course of World War II. And these were vessels that were around 200 feet long, with a surface displacement of 760 tons, and a surface speed of 15 knots, equaling the speed of most surface ships. They had a dive time of 20 seconds to a maximum safe depth of 650 feet, and a range of just over 8,700 miles, and could thus go seven or eight weeks without refueling. So these things were workhorses. They were very effective vessels. But the problem is, even when we say something like that range of 8,700, what typically happened is that it would have a range of half that because after traveling out that far, they would have to be able to get back. And that's in perfect condition as well. But even with how effective these submarines could be, by the end of the war, in the later half, it just wasn't something that was working. And Germany would gradually lose more and more and more with very few successes to show for it. And after a change in leadership due to certain events that I can't necessarily say here on YouTube, because again, it is YouTube, on April 30th, 1945, Karl Donitz, the guy from before, would end up becoming the leader of Germany at this time and would oversee the German forces surrendering to the Allies. The submarines that Germany still had at sea would then have to resurface and would eventually go back to ports that were pre-designated by the Allies. Even though submarines had arguably seen their peak over the course of World War II, simultaneously, this is where they would see their great downfall. By some estimates, Germany lost around three quarters of the U-boats that it built during World War II. And although over the course of the conflict, they would manage to to wreak havoc upon Allied shipping, simultaneously, the position of being a U-boat captain was an extremely dangerous one. Although for that matter, forget being a captain, talk about being a service member during this time. Of the 40,000 sailors that would serve on submarines for Germany over the course of World War II, around 30,000 would end up losing their lives. Truly, at this time, the heyday of the submarine and their use in conventional warfare was over. But their greater purpose as a stealthy nuclear deterrent, well, that, that was something that was only just beginning. Even though we would not see nearly the same amount of submarines that were produced as prior to World War II and during, post-World War II developments were dominated by the Cold War. And in the Cold War, the most important aspect of it between the United States and the Soviet Union was the arms race between the two powers. But as active combat was not something that really was happening, this meant that for the submarine, well, its role was going to have to be a little bit different. As an example, what you can see behind 
behind me here is the Amphion class submarine that was introduced by the British towards the end of World War II. But the submarine's new role, as well as with the development of increasingly sophisticated equipment, meant that gradually over time, these newest submarines were going to be refitted into completely new purposes. They had already been given the Snortmast, a development of the German Snorkel, an air warning radar that worked while the submarine was underwater. Extra streamlining was introduced, which included the removal of the deck gun, but perhaps the most important advances were the complex array of sonar devices that were added to the boat. And all of that is before the devices went nuclear in the first place. Because after World War II, the Americans had been exceptionally busy with another invention of the Germans, the rocket. And this is one of the key things that would become exceptionally important for the design of submarines. Because with U.S. experimentation with sub-launched rockets, this would eventually lead us to the Polaris and Trident submarines. They would also go nuclear in the sense of having developed a suitable power plant for a submarine, in not worry that they were chasing. Remember, this submarine was something that was faster underwater than it was above water, which is definitely saying something. The British, too, would simultaneously develop their own nuclear-powered submarines. You had the Dreadnought, the Navy's first example, which went into sea in 1963, and there were two strands to British design. One, you had the attack submarine with the responsibility of protecting Britain's nuclear deterrent, and the other was the submerged ship ballistic nuclear, the SSBN, which would actually carry Britain's nuclear deterrent. The most famous of the latter was the Resolution Class HMS Conqueror, which would sink the Belgrano during the Falklands War in 1982, and funnily enough, remains the only nuclear submarine with an official kill. Still though, even though we're not going into nearly as much detail as we did with previous things, the Cold War would eventually end, and with that, the role of the submarine in it would change. Not necessarily as drastically as what we would have seen from the end of conventional warfare and the use of the submarine, but for that end, it has kind of lost its purpose today, sort of. With the end of the Cold War, the nuclear submarine was no longer needed necessarily as a nuclear deterrent. They still existed, obviously, when considering modern politics, and I'm sure that many of us have seen already about Russia threatening nuclear war in many different circumstances with what is ongoing with Ukraine. But the submarine is just as dangerous today as it was 100 years ago. In fact, arguably, it's even more considering its modern missile capability. The submarine is something that changed the scope of naval warfare as we know it. And as for what it will do next, well, we don't really know, at least not yet. Only time will tell with what potentially future conflicts are going to bring. But that my friends, is how the submarine changed war as we know it. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. This has been Sakuyi with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. I appreciate all of you for watching. Please let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should do next, and I am very grateful to all of you who have watched. I know from the previous video that I'd done on how snipers had changed war that one of the big criticisms that I had gotten during that time is that many people said that it was a very American-focused thing, which was true. I did heavily focus on American sources because largely what it is that I had at that time was, well, what it is that I could very easily find. There were a number of sources that I found that were German, considering that is where many of the Jaegers began, but unfortunately, I can't read German. I apologize for that. Hopefully, this could show the broader scope and history of the submarines, and you all were able to learn something today. Anyway, I appreciate you all for watching. Thank you very much. Hope you have a good rest of your day, and goodbye, my friends.